Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and this lecture is going to be something I usually do not address in great detail, but it's on radiation dose. And there's been so much information, so much criticism, so much comment, both in the press, TV, and in journals about radiation, that I thought I'd share with you some of the recent articles I've read. And it's information that I think is helpful to all of us, particularly when explaining things to patients or really thinking about things in a logical fashion. It's often my experience that things tend to get carried away. So I'll just give you the two articles that have been the most problematic in many ways and the ones that are typically quoted in the uh, USA Today. And the first article is by Einstein, who in talking about cardiac CT made the point that uh, if you had a cardiac CT, you're increased cancer risk for standard cardiac scans varies from 1 to 143 in a 20-year-old woman to 1 in 3261 for an 80-year-old male. And made the point, and again, this was all based on statistical estimates, that the use of uh, 64 slice CT uh, can result in doses that will have increased cancer risk. Now, the way the article was written, there was nothing really about, you know, the benefits of cardiac CT, many of the other things. And again, notice the word, a simulation model. And the data they used was the Hiroshima data. And another article, same thing, same year, by Brenner, interestingly came out in the middle of RSNA week. And he went even a step further, that looking at risk, he said 0.4% of all cancers may be attributable to a CT radiation dose. And now is even worse. Now maybe 2% of cancer is due to a CT scanning. And that article just really talked about, you know, that CT was directly causing cancer, up to 2% of cases. And obviously, I don't think any of you could pick a case where someone has developed cancer. Otherwise, you'd be seeing lawsuits from getting a CT scan or a number of CT scans. We all recognize that we need to minimize dose to our patients. But this type of data is not very helpful. And again, this is not actual data of what happens to real patients, but statistics based on looking at risk estimates based on the Hiroshima data. Now, the Hiroshima event, which is a one-time event, uh, is not simply getting a CT scan. There was many different radiation exposures at the time. It's hard, and there's been many critics about all that data to extrapolate that out as the gold standard just doesn't do it. But we'll come back to that later. Now, it's interesting, and not necessarily any defense, but uh, this article by Dow made the point that even cardiac CT at its worst was significantly lower than stress tests in terms of radiation dose to patients. Stress tests were in the range of 20 to 25 millisieverts, while CT at its worst was in the 10 to 18 or so millisievert range. So again, it doesn't justify it, but does make the point that we need to be concerned across all different types of studies. Now, there's been many articles we've spoken about in the past about dose reduction strategies from x-ray beam filtration to collimation, all sorts of different opportunities in this article by McCullough. And now the thing that's very important, of course, is these aren't so much strategies, but things that are being put into our scanners. When you buy a new scanner, so for example, we have a new flash scanner, key things about the flash, dose reduction modules, uh, make it that we keep the same quality with a 30 to 40 percent dose on every dose reduction in every patient. Cardiac CT, we can go down to one to three millisieverts. Uh, again, probably an 80 percent dose reduction to standard techniques. So it's important to recognize there are many things that are being done. That's the good news. But again, in, there is always this issue, and particularly in pediatric patients, the whole Alara, you know, as low a dose as possible. And I agree with that. A 100. 20%. But there's been a few articles lately that have really kind of put things in a very nice perspective. Good article by Melvin Cohn, who's a pediatrician. And he asked in this article, pediatric CT radiation dose, how low can you go? And he made a very important point. Is there a risk of lowering the radiation dose so low that you can miss a diagnosis because the images are of poor quality? where the risk of low dose exceeds the risk of the radiation itself. And that's a very good point. And he went further and said there are two types of radiation risk. One, of course, is the risk of potentially developing cancer many years from now. But the second little discussed risk is that of missing a diagnosis because of suboptimal image quality as a consequence of radiation exposure settings that are too low. And this is a point we've made before, that one of the reasons we repeat studies is because the first study is poor. 
often it's sometimes it's poor because the dose was so low you cannot find any information and yes there are many articles in the literature that show you how you can reduce dose and many are very good but many times they point to lesions which you see only because you know they were there and not because you would have picked it up on a routine CT with that kind of radiation dose and Cohn makes the point that adequate radiation dose must be used to make a confident and accurate diagnosis and you need to balance the risk of excessive radiation and the consequence of erroneous diagnosis. Okay, very, very good point. You really need to balance. It's everything in the life is a risk reward. Another article, Vernon Radiographics last year. What should you tell your patient? The risk associated with a radiologic examination appears to be rather low compared to natural risk. However, any added risk, no matter how small, is unacceptable if it does not benefit the patient. And we would all agree, of course, with that, which is why you want to make certain that you know why you're doing the study and you design the protocol to really optimize the information derived from the study and recognize also that CT may not be the study of choice in every single patient. Now, we mentioned before that the vendors are doing a lot, and just to make the point that there is a lot of work going on, here was an article in AJR talking about the uh, manufacturers and radiologists working very closely together and this in the pediatric realm. So again, very important to recognize that things are being done. Let's go back a little backwards. I mentioned before this whole issue about Einstein's articles and Brenner's article and those articles are assuming that radiation has a linear no threshold dose. That whatever you get is bad. Now that concept which is based on the Hiroshima data is not always felt to be true and there's two you know articles in radiology this past month which are really two opposing articles first one risks associated with low dose and low dose of ionizing radiation why linearity may be the best we can do and the second article which says well the linear no threshold relationship is inconsistent with radiologic biologic and experimental data so now let's look at what it says. The little article made the point, excess cancer risks obtained in Japanese atomic bomb survivors and in many medically and occupationally exposed groups exposed at low or moderate doses are generally statistically compatible. For most cancer sites, the dose response in these groups is compatible with linearity over the range observed. A lot of that is just extrapolated data, okay? Now, what about the science? Well. Articles by Tubiana make the point that irradiated cells do protect themselves. The linear plan basically says, in a sense, they don't. Whatever happens, happens, and it's additive. So they talk about now there's immediate defense, repair and damage removal mechanisms, and then delayed and temporary protection also renew DNA damage, irrespective of its causes, that is through adaptive responses. So the body responds to radiation, and responds in a positive fashion. And they go further. The fears associated with the concept of linear no threshold model and the idea that any dose, even the smallest, is carcinogenic, lacks scientific justification. And they show a number of articles that in fact make the point that there is no evidence of a carcinogenic effect for acute radiation at doses less than 100 millisieverts and for protracted radiation at doses less than 500 millisieverts. So again, they were looking very carefully at the data, and the data does not support this linear concept. And they make the point that this linear model was useful a half a century ago, but current radiation protection concepts should be based on the facts and on concepts consistent with current scientific results and not on opinions. Preconceived concepts impede progress. In the case of the linear model, they have resulted in substantial medical, economic, and other social harm. And what they go into further in this article is looking at this Chernobyl event, saying based on the exposure there, there was a certain number of deaths predicted, abortions, on and on and on. And they talk about how many people had abortions just because of fear and showing that the results of what was predicted, fortunately, in no way came to reality, which makes the point that that model just isn't correct. So again, we can argue, and I'm not going to sit here, I'm not a physicist arguing whether that linear model is the right model, but it does make the point that the linear no threshold relationship is not something that's well based in science. And so, again, we need to go with lower radiation dose, but recognize where you're getting the data from. Now, there's another article by McCullough, 
also an AJR, that makes this point. Now, McCall is a physicist at the Mayo Clinic and said the purpose here is to discuss medical justification of the small risk associated with ionizing radiation used in CT and to provide perspectives on practice decisions that maximize overall patient benefits. And they make the point that other people have said, you know, obviously you, you need to get the best imaging study for the patient. You need to know why you're doing the patient. But it's important not to make the patients so worried about radiation to dissuade them or the patients from obtaining needed CT examinations. That people need the studies, if the studies are necessary, then there is no real risk. And in fact, what's the risk of getting a CT? And here's maybe something good to say to patients. Uh, the risk from un dying from a CT is less than that of drowning or of a pedestrian dying from being struck by any form of ground transportation both of which most Americans consider to be an extremely unlikely event. So in other words, your risk at Hopkins of dying from a CT scan is far less than your risk of driving to Hopkins or walking from the parking lot for that matter. So again, risk reward, it's important to understand that. And they make the point that ongoing efforts to ensure CT exams are medically justified and optimally performed must continue and education must be provided to the medical community and the public that puts the risks, but also the benefits of CT in proper perspective. The articles by Brenner, articles by Einstein, don't really say the, all the benefits of CT. The fact that patients don't get unnecessary surgeries and unnecessary anesthesia and all the complications, the fact that patients can be treated early, all of those things people forget to leave out. What about those thousands of patients who died from classic uh, you know, exploratory laparotomy for no reason? or anesthesia complications for no reason. Again, risk reward. Comment by Mayo, AJR again. Advances in CT have resulted in increased CT cardiac applications. The radiologist must understand dose implications and engage in optimal design to achieve adequate image quality with patient dose reduction in mind. And again, makes the point that we have great new technology use it, learn how to use it. So for example, something like uh, dual energy, where potentially you can create virtual non-contrast scans, which would get rid of a non-contrast CT, which by the nature of the fact you would get rid of one portion of the study would reduce dose by about 35%, yet would not change the quality of the examination. Those are important things. So I think that's the kind of things we need to be looking at. That's the kind of directions we need to be going. So I think we really need to be certain that we stay within our boundaries of understanding, recognizing we need to do what's right for patients, we need to do everything correctly, make the right decisions, but not to be caught up in the hysterics and not to throw away the, the bath, the baby with the bath water, as they would say. And uh, again, it's important to really uh, recognize uh, what we can do and where we should be going. And I think it's very important that we don't get kind of uh, bamboozled. Uh, there's a good quote by Lewis uh, Grizzard talking about uh, life is like a dog sled team. If you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. So we need to make certain we're the lead dogs and not just, uh, you know, chasing our tail. And in case you uh, wanted to know, I actually really saw this to be true because in our cruise this past week, I was in Alaska and I took a, the dog sled ride, and uh, here's the view, which definitely shows you that if you're not the lead dog, you ain't seeing a whole lot. And with that, hopefully you found this talk helpful, and I'll see you again next time.